Hey, my fellow Riz Elite members, what is going on? This is Chris with Riz International, and I am joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Riz himself. Riz, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, brother. Thanks for the intro. Oh, no problem. No problem. It's great to have you here. And this, everybody, is your weekly market recap. Uh, so we're going to go into a little bit more depth tonight because we've got Riz with us. So make sure you have all of your questions ready to go because he is ready to do an awesome Q&A session with everybody when we're done and we're really looking forward to it. So let's get started. Let's get the ball rolling. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. Let's take a look at the S&P 500. So it has been a very very interesting couple weeks here in the market. Obviously, when you know, kind of the the tech uh, rally ended, the market came down with it. Both Riz and I have been saying that tech has been holding up the market for quite some time, and the market decided to prove us correct uh, in that fact. Uh, so we had this rollover in tech. We kind of bounced, consolidated, and now we've made a push back down more here towards technical support. Now, if you are keeping an eye on the guidance and insight section on the Discord channel, you would know that we were keeping a very close eye here around this 3225, 3250 area for the S&P 500. And that has proven to be, uh, you know, at least for the time being, support for the market. We had a very, you know, solid bounce here on Thursday and Friday after, you know, mostly a week of down days. Uh, Riz, give us your opinion here. What's been going on with the market? Do you think it's the, you know, the whole inflated tech sector is starting to, you know, lose some gas or is there something else going on? Yeah, great. So yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. That was a great um, sort of recap of the last couple of days on a technical standpoint. Uh, so we see that, you know, really kind of uh, hugging some of the moving averages here. What I believe happened on Friday uh, was more of a, there was some bullish news that came out, right? So it's good to have things in perspective uh, with things outside just the charts. To, we know that, you know, the the House, uh, the Democratic House went back uh, and kind of wants to do, a, you know, I think it's a $2.1 trillion uh, stimulus plan, uh, you know, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, um, and of course the uh, Senate, the Republican Senate, uh, were also working together to kind of pass a proposal a few weeks ago. But as we know, that proposal did not go through. It got backstopped, and you are seeing the market recalibrate that. The market wants, and I would say needs, a stimulus uh, to kind of keep this train going. Am I... Am I of the uh, objective that the world or the U.S., I should say, specifically needs another round of stimulus? No. But, hey, you know, I'm not the one in uh, the office. So, ultimately, uh, we kind of have to take things for what they are. They are working on another one. The market got some bullish news. It was the end of the week after a big uh, kind of a decline. We have seen many tech names sort of consolidate and flatline. We will go into that later. Um, but for now, keeping with, with the SPX, the S&P 500, I do think this is a good, nice, solid ground. I didn't take any positions on Friday, barely taken any positions this week, and it's a slower week um, because we held our, our, our chips close to us. We kept capital at the ready, and we still have capital at the ready. Uh, I did dip my toes earlier in the week uh, in some uh, good, solid tech names, uh, large caps, of course, but still, you know, a lot of ammunition, so to speak, left to be able to utilize this once I see things uh, uh, kind of turn over for the better. Um, we're never going to be able to get the bottom, but you know what? Even if we can decrease our risk and get in when the opportunity is decent, semi-decent even, it's not going to be perfect, but semi-decent even, and I, I'm happy with that. If we can get the meat of the move in the right direction, I'm happy with that as opposed to trying to squeeze every last drop, uh, which usually ends up getting people in trouble. I do see a lot of people coming in and the attendees, so I appreciate everyone getting in here. Uh, not going to drag it on too long, but ultimately the market is looking uh, semi-neutral to bullish. Okay, right now, if I have to say over the weekend, tomorrow, Sunday, um, after 6 p.m. Eastern is when futures open. So that will be a little bit of an indication, a little bit of a, a kind of a teaser. And then if you've been an elite with us for quite some time, you know, sometimes I'm up until 4 a.m. to give you guys that 
pre-market, that early pre-market open, uh, which I think is a bit more of a tell for how the day is going to go. Uh, never a guarantee, of course, but it's a bit of a tell how pre-market opens. Um, and then, you know, we kind of see how things open at for good at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. For sure. No, that's a really great, uh, really great summary of what's been going on. Now, obviously, uh, I'll ask one more question here and then we'll move on to the next uh, the next slide. Obviously, going into November, the elections here in the United States is a really big hot button topic right now. And of course, this is not a uh, political channel. We're not going to talk politics here because for us as traders, politics is mostly irrelevant. All we care about is how it's going to affect the market. Yep. So with that in mind, what are you thinking is going to be the impact of the elections on the market here in the next month or so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great question, Chris. Uh, and I, I love how you mentioned that the whole political thing. You know, there's a lot of political divide in the U.S. And I'm not going to go on my spiel here. But yes, you are right in that whatever way, whatever political candidate or whatever party, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, what really matters is our ultimate end goal, which is, you know, how is this going to play out in the markets? How is this going to affect our portfolio? And no one knows for sure. I don't care if it's a political strategist. I don't care if it's someone in the White House. I don't care if it's someone on either party. No one knows what's going to happen. No one knows and how it's going to impact the market as a result. All we can do is use best case scenarios, um, set up sort of contingency plans and if or then statements type of thing. So lead back into your question. Markets, I can tell you right now, again, this is not me being political. I have no affiliation with any party or any candidate or anything like that. I made that very clear. Uh, but right now, I can tell you whether you like it or not, or anyone likes it or not, markets are uh, bullish on uh, a Trump uh, presidency or Trump uh, victory uh, in this election. Um, and I'm not saying that just based on, on something I just you know had a dream about. I'm saying that based on the policies of the current administration, for better or worse, whatever the case is, it has been more open for business type of, of, of kind of stance. It has been more um, economical and more, I would say, infrastructure and funding and growth uh, type of mindset in, in, in this sort of administration. And the markets like that, obviously, with the whole stimulus bill, the last few few weeks, uh, sorry, few months, I should say, the markets liked, um, obviously, the infrastructure spending over the last few years, the markets liked the tax cuts for, I know the administration says for the middle class, but let's, let's, let's be fair, I've, I've looked at the data, uh, it's benefited significantly, large corporations, uh, and, and we saw these large amounts of share buybacks because of that, right? Uh, it, it saved many of these hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of uh, market cap companies uh, save uh, billions of dollars <laughs> in taxes. So, uh, you know, we thought we were, they were going to use them uh, in more uh, trickle down type of means, uh, but they didn't. Instead of hiring more, instead of spending more on R&D and infrastructure for corporations, they didn't. They just bought more of their shares back. So uh, this has also uh, kind of led to a massive rally over the last couple of years. But Beyond that, get back to your point. Sorry for the tangent. Ultimately, I think uh, markets are bullish on, on Trump. I do think that if Trump wins, markets will kind of set up uh, sort of a base in terms of 3,300, 3,300, 3,200 level at least, uh, sort of a, a floor for markets. Okay, if anyone's expecting like a 20, 30% drop from there, I don't I don't think that's going to happen then. Okay, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh what may happen is if the Democratic uh, nominee, um, is, Joe Biden, uh, is uh, wins the uh, presidency, uh, and depending how the transition of power goes, depending on how seamless it is, uh, you know, markets could potentially pull back. And again, I say this based on historical data that I'm looking at, um, that, you know, the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, is a little bit less uh pro business or pro uh corporations than the current trump uh white house administration so just based on that just based on kind of things like that i can tell you if we did have a very more so left-leaning socialist president win then that's 
just a, a, a massive uh, catalyst for a market drop. But that's not what Joe Biden is. I mean, you know, politi- politics aside, he's more of uh, the middle kind of candidate um, left, obviously, but he's actually one of the more conservatively left uh, uh, liberal uh, Democratic uh, uh, politicians, right? Uh, so again, Politics aside, that's just my viewpoint based on some historical uh, alternate data, let's say, that we look at. Um, Not everything is technicals and support and resistance lines, okay? Uh, So take it for what it is. Uh, For some of you that have questions, hold off on the questions. We will get to that um, at the end of the the, the webinar and and kind of our, our sort of goals here. Uh, hopefully, Chris and everyone, that answers some of your questions in a long-winded way, but uh, that kind of at least gives you some insight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you've got historical data on your side there about Trump. I mean, I remember back in 2016 when he got yeah. elected, the markets went nuts the day after. Yeah, yeah, because remember the the mainstream media, everyone and in, 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 in all these outlets, financial outlets or otherwise, were like, if Trump wins, it's, it's going to be a market crash. Um, and that was what everyone went in. First of all, no one expected, really. Uh, I don't even think Donald Trump expected to win with the way he did. But the, the fact of the matter is he did. And uh, the market did the opposite. They rallied. And of course, they did a good job of getting to work fast. With mm-hmm. If you remember, uh, you know, he came into office January 2017. And then really quickly, they went into implementing a lot of the uh, kind of things that they said they would, which was the economic uh, sort of plan of of boosting uh, infrastructure, spending on on, on corporations, businesses, uh, tax cuts for the middle class, which turned out to be for, you know, very, very, very uh, beneficial for corporations and even many, many uh, highly wealthy individuals. Uh, So that all played played in the fact that, you know, markets saw that as a very bullish sign. And uh, here we are, you know, four years on, well, just about four years on. And wow, has it been a, a, a you know, an eventful four years, <laughs> even by any standards this year. Man, you're not kidding when you're talking about that. All right, let's move on here. Let's take a look at the breakdown for the S&P 500 here. Uh, so this is not the way I want it. There we go. That's better. Uh, so yeah, here is what the S&P 500 has been doing to date. And uh, we are still, even with the corona crash, as I have called it, uh, mm-hmm. we are still positive here on the market for the year, even with this pullback here over these last couple of weeks, still sitting up 1% so far this year. Tech still leading the way, even after it's you know, it's dropped back down here, still up 22% on the year. Uh, Healthcare is the only other index right now that is positive on the year at 0.87%. Utilities, real estate, financials, and energy still in the negative. Energy being in the absolute dumpster down almost or actually over 50% on the year. So, uh, Riz, we were talking about this in, on Discord, and you know, I've been talking about it here on webinar, is saying that basically like tech is propping up the market right now. Is that still kind of your stance of, uh, you know, what's going on? Yep. Yep. So it has been propping up markets. Now we're just kind of seeing them reversion to the mean, right? So what do I mean by that? I mean, in terms of, Chris, if you can highlight over September, you see that gap between the peak of the tech and the red line. See how that's such a large gap, right? That space area, right? Look what's happened. See how the gap has come down. The SPX has kind of held, but the tech, the XLK, uh, sorry, the SPY has held, the XLK has come more closer. So it's kind of bridged that gap a bit. Um, That's really effectively what's known as mean reversion. It's coming back down. But because tech is such a huge part of the SPY, the S&P 500 index ETF, really you were looking at a pullback no matter what if tech drops right there's nothing you know no amount of real estate or financial stocks going up is going to be able to uh kind of make a stock market in tech index rally if tech is dumping it's just because tech is such a big uh part of the uh the index right now because it's market cap weighted so I think it's the situation is better. Is there more downside for tech? Potentially so, uh, because we have seen a rotation out of tech. Remember, the markets are not all or nothing. 
when you see tech sell off, what is happening? That's people, institutions, funds, all these things essentially taking profits. That's them now either going more so cash or rotating into different sectors, right? Sectors which Chris just listed off could be financials, because look at financials, a little bit of a consolidation and then a move up, right? We had a consolidation from July, August, September area. You see that kind of moving sideways. Um, and now we're seeing that little bit of an uptick. Look at, look at uh, you know, things like real estate, you know, a little bit of a recovery from May, all right? Look at, uh, you know, XLV, which is healthcare, still kind of chugging along. And then you see utilities kind of also consolidating and moving up a bit. It's only energy that's been going the wrong way. Everything else has been kind of consolidating and moving up. So what does that tell us? That tells us that potentially from that peak in tech at the end of uh, August, beginning of September, we may now have seen uh, a potential top in tech sector and rotation out into these different sectors. There are other sectors, you know, construction, there's other sectors, but because, you know, there'd be literally 10 others, the, the chart would be an absolute mess. So we show the more major ones like, you know, real estate, financials, energy, uh, and healthcare stuff. But ultimately, I believe it's a rotation out. Uh, there is some sensibility now, you know, Apple, for example, is down 20% from the highs. I think Apple was already way too overdone, but at a 20% drop in the last two, three weeks, I like it a little bit better now. Right. So am I a big fan and frothing at the mouth to buy, buy, buy right now? Not quite just yet. Uh, but do I have, you know, a small position now? Do I kind of dip my toes in a bit? Yes. Right. That's ultimately what it is. It's all about contingencies. Right. If it goes lower, I can add more. If it continues to go up, well, guess what? I already have a small position anyway. So that's the way you want to look at it. You want to recalibrate things in that way. Um, so yes, I think uh, markets are, uh, I think a lot more, I would say sensible now. Does it mean that, you know, a sell off is over? Does this mean that there's no more downside? No, I think uh, there is downside. One thing you can expect for sure is an increase in volatility. Uh, even the brokerages are preparing for this with uh, increasing margin requirements and uh, as I mentioned in Elite uh, on Friday. So keep that in mind. We are in for some more volatility and volatility doesn't mean down only. Volatility means up and or down, okay? Both ways, we are in for more volatility. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, more choppiness or violent whipsaws are also uh, something that can occur. So, so, so keep that in mind uh, and protect your portfolio, protect your account in that way, uh, however you see best fit. So what do you think caused this huge rally in tech? I mean, was it just coronavirus? Because people were thinking, oh, okay, people are working from home now. They have to use technology more. Or is there something else behind this? Yeah, yeah. It's just been a big crowded trade. I refer to this as a crowded trade. Crowded trades are where anyone and everyone, not just retail traders and investors, but also even funds, they effectively kind of just pile in. They dogpile into this one sector, one stock, or, or one hype thing. And we saw this with, uh, you know, uh, weed stocks back in 2017, 2018. Um, you know, now this year it's been tech. In many ways, rightfully so, because what's one sector that, and, and Chris beautifully at the right time brings up Tilray. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's just, it's absurd. <laughs> you know, August, 2018, uh, it was just in uh, September 2018, stuff like that for Tilray's was crazy. But yeah, back, back to my point, I think ultimately when it comes to the tech sector, it has been the biggest benefactor uh, from all this. What's one sector that it's immune to COVID? Hmm. Tech. You know, you've seen anything and everything that is mobile, home, uh, office, home, uh, work from home, everything, study from home, all these things just go up, right, uh, nonstop. You know, Zoom has been the biggest benefactor. Amazon has been a really big benefactor of this. Uh, you know, every tech stock, really. And not all of them have gone up justifiably so. Some of them have just been going up because they're riding the coattail of other tech stocks, right? So uh, absolutely, this momentum has come in uh, because the market thought, whoa, wait a sec, everything's selling off. 
but not everything is in the dumpster. Amazon is not in the dumpster back in March. It was actually the opposite. People were buying more from Amazon. Amazon has done insane amounts of hiring. It's just mind blowing. Uh, and so then the market recalibrated right in April, May, uh, and then it just was off to the races, whether it was Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, it's just been off to the races, right? And uh, and only now, since September, have we started getting a little bit of some clarity, some profit taking, some rotation, right? So very, very interesting as we head into the last month before the coveted U.S. federal election. It's one of the most decisive, one of the most uh, important, one of the most anticipated elections, if you will, uh, and we are on the precipice of it. So, yes, uh, all in the midst of a, of a, of a you know, a, a pandemic or a virus outbreak. So, yes, we are in uncertain, uh, uncharted territory, but interesting nonetheless. Absolutely. All right, let's keep going. I, I know we're going to have some things to talk about here on these two slides, as these are two of our more popular things to discuss here in RIS International. Now, guys, you have to understand that I have referred to RIS as the oil tycoon for quite some time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after oil apocalypse here, uh, where we had just the, uh, yeah, and we talked about this in uh, in Discord, yeah, oil actually did not go negative, just so there's no confusion about that. Uh, but we were in on this recovery a little bit here. And uh, I remember, I think it was the last time you were on webinar, we had two areas that we were looking at. It was the $40 per barrel area and 45. Now, obviously we didn't quite make it back up to 45. And we've had kind of a bit of a rollover here in the last couple of weeks uh, in oil. And it's kind of come back to this 40 area and continues to consolidate. Riz, what in the world is going on with oil? Yeah, so oil is one of those things that too has been, um... I mean, we saw this back in, uh, uh, you know, like you highlighted with with that big meltdown in oil. Uh, it, it's been uh, negatively impacted this year with the whole demand. It's not like oil uh, demand was increasing significantly with with uh, leading into the year, but the COVID stuff just completely, you know, put a nail in its coffin. So energy has been brutalized. It's come back because the market sees a value to oil. Uh, and, and right now that's an equilibrium price of 40. I mentioned this many months ago. I said the exact words I said, I think equilibrium price for oil is $40 per barrel. And look at that. It's literally been buffering in and out uh, within a spread of a dollar up or down. And you can see that, uh, and, and you know, you can look back at my words. Um, am I saying I knew that for certain? No, it's just experience, right? And uh, here we are, we're still at 40. You know, we didn't touch 45 yet. I think 45 is a good case. I even said 45 is a good base case for bullish oil in the medium term because I don't see it going above 50. I don't see it going to 60 anytime soon. Not with COVID dragging out, not with less people traveling, not with less people commuting, period. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what we've seen. And I still see forty dollars a, a barrel, forty-five max, about till the uh, end of the year. That's a that's a very specific call. Um, we'll see if I'm right or wrong. But uh, so far, it's uh, it, it's worked out exactly as I've said. Uh, that's my view. Uh, hopefully, that sheds a, a very specific light on on where I see things, uh, whether you agree or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think forty dollars is a, is is sort of the sweet spot, the equilibrium uh, spot for oil uh, for now. And guys, this is the reason why you'll note that we haven't really been taking all that many oil trades like we were before. In years past, we would be in and out of oil at least fifteen, twenty times a year. Uh, I don't think it's been more than three or four this year, if I recall. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on. To the second best friend of ladies, that would be gold. Uh, sorry, we don't have diamonds here. Uh, but guys, we were talking about this last week, and I, I drew this lovely little wedge pattern for you. And I wanted to remind everybody who's here, because I'm guessing there's some people who are here that weren't here from last week. Uh, this was basically just to show what was going on, guys. You know, we were seeing, you know, this, this pattern here going on with gold. And I told you, there's no way to know what was going to happen when we finally get to the point whether we break one direction or another. It just depends on who has more. And obviously, right now, it looks like the bears had a little bit more, more as far as gold prices. So, you know, Riz, uh, I, we know that gold is, you know, there are out, external forces that are playing 
uh, a role on that, not just, you know, technical indicators and things like that. Um, what's been going on with the price of gold? And, you know, with this drop, do you think it's a good time to maybe get in? Yeah, so good question. Great wedge. And you can see that breakdown from that uh, sort of a squeezing wedge there you see. And uh, the bears have sort of taken control for now. You could see that with the few red candles. Um, this is not uncommon. Uh, you know, $2,000 an ounce was way too much already. I was not a buyer. I, and, you know, I, I can tell you genuinely straight up that I missed the gold rally after 1500. I was like, you know what? I can't, I can't justify getting in. And then it went to 2000, right? It went up a full uh, 20, 25% more from that point. And uh, here we are now at 1860. So yeah, I missed the rally up, but at least I didn't buy near the top. Like many people did. I know people were buying in at 2000 thinking this is it. This is the new golden age, so to speak. Um, where do I see gold going next? Uh, I think there's more downside to gold. I think the market and institutions got a bit too far ahead of themselves when it comes to buying up uh, gold ETFs, gold-based assets. Uh, so I don't see, uh, you know, I don't see it too far-fetched to see gold going down to $1,800 an ounce. Uh, and as a result, obviously silver and other metals are, uh, follow suit as well. With that said, keep in mind, gold is seen as a bit of a hedge. I mention this every time. Uh, and the reason gold was going up along with markets was because there's this kind of uh, uh, sort of a disparity between markets going up. And then on the flip side, usually when markets go up, what happens? People leave safe haven assets. People leave the U.S. dollar. People get out of bonds. People get out of gold and go into markets, you know, equity markets, whether it's tech sector or whatever. That was not the case over these past few months, right? Now, the case was markets were going up, tech was rallying like crazy, but then gold was too, right? Signified by that $1,500 uh, rally uh, since $1,500. And well, now we see it correcting. We see that divergence correcting a bit now. And um, again, for me, I'm not buying gold uh, or, or silver at this point. I'm not shorting it either. Don't get me wrong. When I say I don't buy something, doesn't mean the opposite is true. Uh, not buying is not the same as shorting. Okay. So many people think, well, really, if you're not buying, why not short? No, uh, not buying is, uh, a careful calculated decision itself. Um, uh, you don't need to be exposed to one side or the other. Uh, so I'm not shorting gold just to be very clear. I'm also not buying it. So I'm waiting and I'm okay with sitting out. I haven't been trading gold too much this year at all. Uh, similar with oil, if, if for those of you that have been monitoring and in, in elite uh, for some time would know that, you know, the, the oil and gold trades have gone down significantly and that's for a reason, right? So uh, I'm okay with watching and using it as kind of a barometer of what's happening in market sentiment, what's happening with sort of investors kind of setting themselves up for safe haven asset classes or maybe being more bullish and seeing how that kind of struggle works. And I mentioned... In Elite recently, uh, I think it was a Thursday, I said, look, the U.S. dollar is going up, all right, U.S. dollar strengthening, uh, you know, gold is kind of just uh, decreasing. We've seen uh, uh, the markets also pull back. When you see these things kind of occur, uh, you can't say for certain, but you can get sort of an idea that, wait a sec, maybe there is some more downside. Maybe the markets are now... Uh, kind of feeling a bit antsy, right? So this is one key factor that we look at. You know, U.S. dollar, we look at gold prices, we look at oil prices, commodities. Uh, it's not just about, you know, a specific stock or it's not just about a specific sector. There's many things that's afoot uh, in and outside of the markets. Yeah, guys, and this is kind of what I'm talking about, looking at the bigger picture. There's so many different facets that go into the price of a security, especially if we're looking at a commodity such as gold or oil or things like that. There are a lot of different factors that are playing in on that price point. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little surprised about this drop in gold. I honestly expected with the market looking a little weak that we we're going to see the price of gold go up. All right, well, let's get back to taking a look at some specific securities here. Uh, you said you had a couple that you wanted to look at or you wanted to talk about. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, you know some things in tech you wanted to take a peek at. So why don't we go ahead and start with that? And uh, if guys, if you guys uh, have something that you want to ask us about, by all means, go ahead and post up in the chat uh, and we can go ahead and take it for you. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a couple of stocks, I think, you know, we might want to just look at, um, you know, Apple is obviously one I think is setting up for a nice uh, setup right now. Do I, I think I definitely, definitely like it at hundred dollars. That full dollar mark also signifies uh, a, a sort of a, a support uh, as well. And uh, a previous high before the big rally leading up to uh, the split. Right. I also like, um, let me bring my list up here. Um, I And again, they may be a bit tech focused, uh, but can you bring up Google for me as well? G-O-O-G, um, again, a larger price stock, but this is also another leader. There is no other Google, uh, extremely wide moat. This is setting up great for another uh, uh, entry as well. Look at that beautiful bounce right up from that 200 day moving average at 1400. Like just anyone that said, you know, moving average this or that, well, say what you want about them. Um, sometimes these full dollar marks keyed with uh, a, a solid 200 day moving average can be very, very powerful. Um, so Google is another, right? There's literally an entire list of, uh, I can't, I don't even know if it's like close to a hundred stocks that I sent with specific buy points um, in Elite, right? So the Elite members got this and they continue to get a, a, an updated one every month. So that's not something I was gonna give, but this year I started doing that. Um, uh, so these are just a couple two things if you're watching, uh, some potential ideas, both in tech. Obviously I really like, you know, um, some great dividend companies as well. Remember, I don't buy companies because they give it dividend. I buy great companies and then the dividend is just a bonus. OK, uh, that's one way you want to look at that. Uh, but yeah, two ideas for now. Uh, I'm just waiting and seeing what else kind of plays out. Um, I don't want to give people any inclination that, OK, I need to buy this or that right now uh, because we're not at that point just yet. Uh, one thing I do want to say is I want to answer. I know Eddie has been waiting for an answer uh, to his question. Uh, you know, he asked, is that a falling wedge on the SPX? Uh, and that there was one uh, on QQQ as well, which is the uh, the NASDAQ uh, uh, ETF, right? So I'm not a big wedge kind of person, but to me, this is a, is a classic um, sort of a, a reversion to the mean, a classic breakdown from an uptrend. So you can see it, you know, this Chris is drawing this kind of wedge here. Uh, for me, it's more of a down downtrend, a trend channel down as well. You can look at it as that if you want. Uh, I do think this 260 level is key. It's a key level. Obviously, you can even see it with, with some of the moving averages, but the 260 is a key level. Uh, similar story with the SPX, right? The SPX to 3,200, 3,300, I think is the kind of the very, very strong support. Uh, sorry, 3,300, I should say, is that kind of key point. Uh, anything below the 3250, 3200 level is uh, it gets spelling for more downside, right? And I mentioned that. Uh, so definitely keep an eye on that. It looks very similar to the QQQ, right? The, the, the NASDAQ index is, you know, there's a lot of overlap with the NASDAQ index and uh, the SPX. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Um, Gage is asking me, can, I, can we be able to pull up store? ST our store capital um it is a great uh, uh sort of a a reit it's a great um kind of a reit type of play uh i like it it's actually in one of my lists uh it's actually on my watch list as well and it's it's all about kind of where you feel comfortable getting in um understand that this had a big drop just like everything else in march especially because it's more more so uh exposed uh i don't know the exact details of the financials of this company but ultimately i do like it from a brief glance uh i think it's it's a good dividend stock as well so long as you have the stomach to hold through i wouldn't be surprised if this thing goes lower uh to 22 23 area um so keep that in mind Next question. We got some people typing, so bear with us here. We got uh, some questions coming in. Um, Larry, I appreciate that. Yes, those those lists are great. I know I, I enjoy sending them out because for me, it's so much easier and, and, and sort of a clarity for others to kind of see these specific stocks that I monitor and, and kind of like at certain price points. And, and it kind of takes some of the debt 
guesswork out. So I really like that. Uh, CNQ, Josh asks, what about CNQ? Big drop. CNQ is one that, you know, I've traded in and out. I hold for long term as well. I love the company for long term. It's sort of a breakdown with energy. Okay, Josh, uh, you know, you'll notice CNQ is down. ENB, uh, as well as another pipeline, Canadian pipeline, natural resource type of energy company. See how it's all looking the same, right? Uh, I think TRP is another one that chart might look similar. So it's not something specific. See that? So not something specific to CNQ, all right? Understand that many stocks will go up and down simply because they're in a similar sector. Maybe some funds are getting out. Uh, maybe investors are now you know, not as bullish on energy resources, pipelines as they were uh, back in, you know, July, August. So these things ebb and flow. It's like an up and down. It's like a pendulum. All right. We saw a lot of momentum come in April and May uh, and even June for these companies. And then they've kind of been consolidating. Right. So I like I like CNQ around this price point. Can it go lower? Sure. But you know what? We're not we're not in the business of trying to catch bottoms and we're not in the business of being able to tell the future. So uh, we do a probabilities type of thing here. And uh, I like it at this price point. Uh, so for me, it's all about longer term on this thing. And uh, Eddie, oh, Josh, Man I hope that answers. Yeah. Uh, so Manel, we're getting some questions here on uh, DOCU. Manel says, I'd love your opinion on the evolution of the DOCU. It's been his top gainer and with second wave potentially coming, I think it might be a good yeah. opportunity. Yeah, Docu, DocuSign is huge uh, surge in, in, in sort of revenues and earnings and everything really. <laughs> it's 2020, what a, what a ride, right? And uh, yes, I think, I think this is a good opportunity. I think it was already overdone a bit. So this is okay. I'm not frothing at the mouth, like I said before. I don't think it's like, oh my God, the deal of the century type of thing. But this is a good point. This is a good point. You know, I think 180, you know, would be a great, great entry if it does pull back with tech, but it's looking very strong, right? Take a look at the, you know, I think it was uh, yesterday, Friday, Thursday, Tuesday was a big bullish day, right? So it's looking really good. I like the company in terms of a, a sort of a growth prospect, a recovery prospect and a COVID play, like you mentioned, right? So yes, I think it has some upside. Just be careful with this thing. Um, it has a, it's had a huge run up already, right? Huge run up. So uh, we want to make sure we're not kind of like hanging on to this play that's already up, you know, a few hundred percent. Uh, over the last six months. Okay, uh, that's one thing. Uh, uh, Eddie had a question, uh, uh, I think, uh, but it was Docu, um, just just as Menel had. So, uh, perfect. I don't think, let's, yep, we just got another question. Disney, Jacob asked, uh, you know, about Disney. It's on the value list price, Florida reopening phase three, as we mentioned, and that also that fantastic news was also shared by John uh, and a few others about, you know, different phases in Florida state and other states as well. Uh, it is a definitely a big positive. You can see Disney also having a good couple of days, Thursday and Friday, kind of holding on to that 120 area. And I think Disney is good for a nice pick up one thing to keep in mind that's negative for Disney outside of technicals and, and, and the reopening for their Disney parks is they had to push their timeline on some of their big Marvel uh, movies, right? Um, whether you like them or not, uh, you know, they, they had to push that timeline forward. So just keep that in mind. I don't think it's a bad entry. I really, really like it at 110, at 120, 124. Yeah, great, great for, for an entry. Starter position, like you said, it's great. Um, don't feel too bad if you take an entry and, you know, even if, regardless of my list, I know it's on my list but that I shared, but that aside, even if you take an entry and, and you know, it's not, you know, at the right price that it's mentioned in the list, that's fine. As long as you're okay with it. Um, if you take an entry in 124, let's say on Monday, for example, and it goes down to 120, if it goes down to 118, don't sweat it, right? It's Disney. Uh, you know, if you have excess capital, you have excess conviction, then maybe at the point where you want to see if you add more. But that's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. Um, taking these positions, smaller entry positions, especially in a market like this, and being happy and content with what you're able to extract. You know, we're not trying to hit the moon. We're not trying to hit for the for the for the fences here. We're not trying to mortgage the house. We're not trying to. Um, you know, go all in. Uh, so we take a very calculated uh, risk management and I would say cautious approach. And 
that's why many of our, our members and everyone uh, in Elite and followers do well because we're not trying to hit for the home basis after mortgaging the house or or losing our shirt. So yes, a uh, bit of a, a tangent, but yes, absolutely. I think uh, Disney is a good entry for now, starter position. More questions, is he? Sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, you were talking about the movies. Don't forget that Mulan flopped. It was terrible. Yeah, I didn't even wanna watch that. Uh, I didn't wanna watch it. Just, yeah, I didn't watch it. I mean, I mean, it's not really my kind of movie anyways, but no, I, I don't have kids or anything. So yeah, I didn't watch it. So yeah, I'm not surprised it flopped. Uh, there was a lot of uh, negative publicity around it and kind of the direction they went and all that. So yeah, that kind of put me off too. But on the positive note, Mandalorian season two is coming out next month yes so yes that's i forgot to send uh the trailer you know the trailer for the season two Dude, i know sick. a lot of us in elite since last year have been on the mandalorian train with baby yoda and this is the way stuff john mentioning it now in the chat <laughs> it's been a good well last year seemed like 10 years ago but uh, <laughs> um jacob brings up big c uh big commerce this is one we've mentioned in elite uh, John uh, has mentioned it as well. Uh, look at this a recent IPO back in August, right? So uh, I like it at this price point. It's doing really well the last few days. This is a great entry point in my view. Again, keep in mind, it is a recent IPO. It is a newer stock. It is in the competition sphere of the likes of Shopify and Wix and stuff like that okay so just in case you didn't know exactly what they did um i do see some upside i think this is a good one for for uh medium term at the very least uh you know the technical setup looks good as well for upside you know i think this can go to 100 i think i said uh in, in thursday or friday i think uh, it can definitely go to 100 keep in mind how the market moves will also matter right if you see a market sell-off it doesn't matter if it's johnson and johnson or at&t or apple you're gonna see big commerce move down too most likely so keep that in mind all right caveat uh with, with what happens in markets can impact uh even a company like big commerce so overall all things considered technicals everything like that i think it's good for a long i like it i mentioned it as well in uh, elite just so you know, guys, if I ever get my own IPO, it's going to be Big D, uh, just so you're aware of that. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, um, Gage asks, can you yeah, call it BA and yeah, Starbucks? Yeah, yeah, BA and Starbucks. Uh, anything specific on that, Gage? Uh, BA, great little rally, 7% pop. I remember seeing it on Friday. Uh, after kind of getting beat down, this 150 level is really good. Just be careful, right? Just be careful with any airline related. I know BA isn't an airline, but you know, it's partial defense company, partial airline type of thing. Um, I do like it, but this is one of those things that can just continue to just linger and not do much and just be a pain to trade. Okay. So if you're okay with it and you're okay, you're okay with knowing what you're in for. Uh, as you can see all the way from June, you kind of get an idea what you're in for. Unless some crazy news comes out, which causes a breakout, you kind of know what you're in for, okay? Um, 170 area is kind of that area that it just kind of goes up to 170, 175, and then it just pukes. So something to think about, Starbucks. Thank you, Chris. So this is also looking nice personally. You know, I would personally wait till 80. I'm not too like going crazy over the company and fraud, like, you know, just wanting to buy it now, now. Uh, but, you know, at 80, I like it. 75, I like it even more. Okay, really nice supply zone or sorry, uh, really nice demand zone kind of area and, and consolidation area that kind of tells me there's a lot of confidence in that price point. So 75 is a good, good entry. Even 80, if you think, you know, you want to swing it, that's fine. What are your thoughts on airlines at this moment with different states stepping up on phases? Yes, so this one's very interesting. Um, airlines have been one of the most heavily traded sectors, docks uh, of this year. Why? Because they, they, along with cruise ships, have been the biggest um, sort of uh, impact to this whole COVID stuff, negative impact, I should say. Um, 
So Carnival is, is one that just Chris just brought up, but airline specifically, uh, I think, you know, something like DAL, DAL is one that I've traded in and out. Um, most of them all move in tandem, you know, together, but, you know, DAL is one I trade. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it's kind of looking good, especially with some of that news that came out with them wanting to do like a 30 minute to an hour type of test, ramping up testing at the airport, ramping up testing is great. Um, it gives flyers, staff, and investors even great amount of confidence knowing that something like that can be implemented. It's all going to come down to the execution, right? So this is great. Uh, I think this is a good good area for, for an entry. I wouldn't go large. I wouldn't go big. Um, I would just kind of test the waters. And I think it can definitely kind of bounce up from this 28 area. Um, and now it's, I know it's closer to 20, 29, 30, but still... Uh, I would I would definitely keep an eye on this. Keeping it, I, I've said that you know, don't go big. If you have a long enough time frame, you should do well so long as you survive. Keep in mind there's a catalyst that I believe the administration is current administration is out supposed to be releasing some kind of news or something with the potential. Remember keyword potential bailout positive funding news for these airlines i'm not sure if cruise lines are going to be included but airlines is one of them so that could be why we've seen that nice bullish day on airlines with boeing and delta and even some cruise lines on friday okay hopefully that kind of sparks your interest there absolutely and obviously keep an eye guys on the the eu if the eu opens up travel again uh to you know the west uh, and other nations, that would definitely be a good catalyst if we could see something there. Because I think that uh, obviously the my day job, we we do a lot of travel in Europe, and so that's that's definitely yeah. hampering us. But that's I think, big. yeah, that's it big. would help a lot. Yep. Yeah, because intra EU travel has been open. I don't know about now if they're rolling things back, but it's they've kind of really shut down the U.S. from the outside world, right? Um, so yeah, if that opens up. I'll be honest, I don't think that's going to happen just yet, especially in the midst of cases spiking. Even up here where I am, we've seen a lot of cases increasing, um, obviously in certain parts of the U.S. as well, along with countries in Europe. So I don't think now is that time where we're going to see things open up again. If that time was supposed to happen with allowing you know travel between Europe and U.S., it would have been in the summer. I don't see that happening now, but hey, that's just my two cents. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, my wife being from Ukraine, obviously, we keep an eye on that uh, fairly closely. And they've had the borders closed for like the last month. It's been frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting worse. And Russia had the largest amount. I know it's yeah. obviously different countries, but just to give you an idea, uh, you know, Russia had a huge uptick in cases. Uh, and in one of the most cases for the date in terms of COVID cases was Russia. It's usually it's India over the last few, few weeks, but uh, it's been Russia today. Yeah, I don't see anybody chatting or typing at the moment, so I think you've you've pretty much just got them all awestruck at this point, Riz. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I think uh, it's a joint effort. I think uh, you know we all appreciate. Um, I don't think I know so. We all appreciate what you do. I do. We all we all uh, you know have a fantastic time in Elite already. It's great to have everyone there, have everyone support. It does matter a lot. I take uh, what I do. Um, very seriously in a sense that not like uptight serious, but I mean, seriously, that I, it, it means a lot. It's, I value it a lot. Um, uh, I hope everyone else uh, does as well. It's been great um, to have uh, everyone in there and kind of the banter and the chatter. It's great. Uh, a lot of amazing people in there, a lot of amazing people that have uh, been alongside me with, with this journey uh, through the ups and downs. Um, I appreciate that. And I think uh, Manuel has one question. FVR Fiverr. Fiverr is another tech play that's done really well. Huge rally again with no looks of stopping. I avoid personally these kind of trades. These are just pure momentum trend following chase type of trades. Can it continue to go up? Absolutely. Is it something I'm getting into? Absolutely not. <laughs> It's just my two cents there. Um, yeah, just not really my kind of setup or trick. Just me. Okay. Um, thank you, Gage. Thank you for everything. Um, I appreciate everyone getting on. I think it's a good time to kind of leave it here. I hope everyone got something out of it. 
I hopefully, uh, hopefully I think, uh, you know, the questions were answered sufficiently and I thank you for your time. I know it's not easy getting on. It's, you know, whatever time that you are, uh, whatever times you're in it, it's just great to have this and, and be able to get on and communicate and, and it's different. It's different from being in the chat room. So I enjoy coming on whenever I can. Uh, it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you for your commitment and uh, for everything that you do, Chris and everyone else as well uh, in the chat room. It does not go unnoticed. Uh, for those of you watching that weren't able to attend, that's fine. Hopefully you'll join us uh, sometime and uh, it's been awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's great having you on, Riz. And as I like to always close all my webinars with, we'll see you guys in Discord on Monday. Good night, everybody. Sounds good. Ciao, guys.